Now, this is in the average population, not the athlete population. I'm curious about this. As far as like, you know, sodium is concerned, we have, you know, we've had Stan Efferding on. A lot of people have come onto the podcast and talked about like the benefits of sodium because in the general population, many people, including people in my family, are doing the best they can to avoid salt and salting their foods. So why do why would that be something that people would maybe want to do? And is there a context in when people should avoid sodium if like they're not an athlete or anything? Or are is sodium kind of maybe demonized and people are misunderstanding it? Great question. And it's a little bit of both and it's context specific. Mm. So first of all, because we now understand the concept that wherever sodium goes, water follows, mm-hmm. our kidneys have evolved to be really good at handling salts. So really good at handling sodium, for example. I mean, we evolved in the oceans. We've evolved in a salty environment. And even though we've left the oceans, we've still got the oceans inside of us. 60% of us is this salty water. Mm. And so the kidneys are really good at handling salt. So a lot of people who take excess salt, kidneys usually quite good, just get rid of it. But when it gets rid of sodium, it usually has to get rid of water as well. Some people within the population are sodium sensitive. And we don't really know why. And so what this means is that if you were to take a group of people with chronic hypertension. So hyper means above, tension is referring to the pressure. So they've got chronically elevated blood pressure. 50% of them would be sodium sensitive. And what that means is their sodium intake is tightly correlated with their blood pressure. And so reducing sodium will also reduce their blood pressure. Now that's 50% of people with chronic hypertension. 25% of people who don't have hypertension are also sodium sensitive, but it's likely that they probably don't ingest sodium to a quantity that is resulting in the hypertension. Now, this is in the average population, not the athlete population. Yeah, We know that athletes, when they sweat, they're going to be not just releasing water through their sweat glands, but also various so- ions like sodium and, and chloride and, and so forth. And so they do need to replenish those salts. The thing is, even though we know, one, they need to replenish those salts, We don't actually have any number that's given out by any governing bodies, any research institutes or anything that says this is how much you need to replenish. And this is where the difficulty comes. This is where that context comes is because somebody running a marathon is obviously going to need greater replenishment than somebody doing a 30-minute bench workout. And so, again, context specific there. Um, We do need that sodium. The thing is that because it's most of that sodium sits outside the cells, it's also in the blood and interchangeable with the bloodstream. So anything outside the cells, that includes the tissue outside the cells, the space outside the cells, but also the bloodstream. Mm. So anything you ingest is going to go from the bloodstream to the area outside the cells. And so if you ingest too much sodium, it goes into the bloodstream, jumps out of the bloodstream and then bathes the cells. Now, the great thing is our kidneys, like I said, have evolved a mechanism to remove that sodium. But if we can't, One, the water builds up outside the cells and in the bloodstream and the blood pressure goes up and sometimes fluid retention can occur. But it can also pull water from inside the cells out if it's not managed. And that's the process of osmosis. And so your body loves to maintain balance. And so in medicine and health and biology, the most important concept for anyone to understand is homeostasis, which is the point that regardless of any function that your body performs, It needs to maintain a happy, healthy balance. There's a range. There's upper limits and lower limits. Mm. And ideally, you'll function best within those limits. And that's the same with sodium. Now, with sodium, those limits are greater. So you can have relatively low, relatively high, and still function quite well. But for other things like potassium, it gets more narrow. So other ions or electrolytes, it gets narrow. And that's because it has a different function and it doesn't sit outside the cells. Potassium sits inside the cells. So again, context specific. Power Project family, how's it going now on this podcast? Mark Andrew and I, we talk about fasting a lot. We talk about the ketogenic diet and a lot of different types of diets. But Bub's Naturals has a product. They have the collagen protein, which is amazing. They have these apple cider vinegar gummies, which are like crack. But they have (laughs) these, yeah, they have these MCT oil powder packets that Ah, I've never used to do this, but in the morning I'll wake up and I'll put it in coffee and the smoothness, number one, in terms of the mixing is amazing, but the consistency of my energy through the day because of the MCT oil powder is peak. Andrew, Mm. 
how's your experience with yeah no that's exactly it it's like the best way to start the day uh you're satiated you're energized and you're just ready to crush the day uh so if you guys want to get in on this mc2 oil powder head over to bubsnaturals.com and at checkout enter promo code power project to save 20 percent off your entire order again bubs naturals promo code power project to save 20 percent off links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes what's a cure for like a leg cramp like i you know i, I used to in the middle of the night, I would like stretch and then sure enough, I'd get like a hammy cramp or a calf cramp. Um, and then I've talked to other relatives of mine too, and they end up with the same, you know, same symptoms. I don't have them anymore. I think the electrolytes have helped a ton, but uh, in your opinion, what, what do you think causes that for some folks? We don't know. So that's the first answer. That's the simple answer. Mm. Uh, magnesium has always been touted as the cure or treatment for cramps, but all the studies show that it, it's pretty poor at doing it. We know that it does have something to do with electrolyte concentrations across cells, but it's probably a combination of electrolytes in addition to things such as uh, the neuromuscular junction. So when the nervous system talks to a muscle, it's a neuron, then there's a little gap, and then there's the muscle. And that neuron needs to release a chemical called acetylcholine that needs to cross that gap. And then it needs to bind to receptors that release sodium and then release calcium. So sodium and calcium are important. The reason why they thought magnesium was uh, the treatment for cramps was because magnesium antagonizes calcium. Now, what that means is it does the opposite, basically, of calcium. It, it stops calcium from doing what it wants to do. And what calcium wants to do is tell muscles to contract. So anytime calcium is inside of a muscle cell, that muscle cell will contract, regardless of what type of muscle, right? So you've got heart muscle, you've got skeletal muscle, and you've got smooth muscle. So heart muscle pumps blood around the body. Skeletal muscle is attached to your skeleton, allows the locomotion, you to do weights, run, jump, lift, move, and sing. But then you've got the smooth muscle, which are the hollow muscles of your digestive tract, your reproductive tract, your renal system, your blood vessels. So calcium is required for all of those. And so what we used to think was, because calcium tells these muscles to contract and magnesium antagonizes, does the opposite of calcium. If we give somebody magnesium, they won't get cramps. But unfortunately, the studies don't show it. So the best advice I could offer is hydration would be the first one. And just to make sure that you do have adequate electrolytes, not crazy amounts, even though your kidneys are going to be really good at filtering those, but adequate amounts of electrolytes. On that note, I, I want to kind of ask this because you mentioned that for athletes, we are not sure the amount of electrolytes to take in. It's like, there's no standard. So yeah. for an athlete that's doing, whether it be whatever sport they're doing, what are the physical cues that an athlete can like pay attention to within the way they're feeling during a workout or the way they feel post-workout? That's like, oh shit, I need some electrolytes. Because for example, we were doing some, I was, me and Mark were doing some movements from this guy, Cloris Sustenter, who came on the podcast. Once I went home, I sat down <laughs> and when I got up, I was perpetually stuck in this position because all of the <laughs> muscles in my groin were cramping up. Drank some electrolytes, a few minutes later, I was able to start moving. So I should have probably had electrolytes before that, but what should an athlete mm. be paying attention to so they understand time to get some fucking electrolytes? <laughs> yeah, great question. Generally speaking, the body is really intuitive. And so anytime there is water balance changes or electrolyte or salt changes, your brain picks it up instantly. And the great thing is that it's one of the most uh, important mechanisms that we have for maintaining life because we all need water, right? And we yeah. all need those salts because we need water for survival, uh -huh. but we need the salts to tell the water where to go. And so if you've either not had enough water intake or you've done so much exercise that the water has been removed from your body, that may be either through sweat, but you lose a lot of water through just breathing. So the... the you, your breath is humid, so there's water molecules attached to the, the gas that comes out. You actually release a lot. Um, one of the things that, just as a digression, one of the things that uh, medicos need to think about when they've got uh, a comatized patient is dehydration because of all the breathing that they're doing and because they've got a tube down their throat that takes away in, what we call insensible water loss just through breathing. So the thing that happens is when the water balance changes or the electrolyte or salt balance changes, your brain picks it up, specifically an area called the hypothalamus. And it picks it up because the cells will either shrink 
or they'll swell. So if you've lost too much water from your body, that means it's more concentrated outside your cells. So if you think you've, you've got a, a bucket of water with a bit of salt in it, if you only remove the water and leave the salt, that bucket becomes more concentrated, even though there's less water. The same thing happens in the body. So when you exercise, you actually sweat out more water than you do salt. So you can become slightly dehydrated in that sense, but also your concentration of electrolytes goes up paradoxically and your hypothalamus picks it up because the cells start to shrink a little bit because the water moves out and then you get thirsty. So your mouth gets dry, you drink some water uh, and you start changing your behavior. So amazingly, your behavior changes. That's the very first thing without you even noticing. You just reach for water. You start drinking water. Um, so it's listening to those physiological cues is the first point. Mm. But the problem comes in athletes. So because athletes will do intense bouts of exercise, they're going to remove water, remove irons, probably faster than the body has time to say, hey, go get that drink. Hey, go get that supplement. Hey, go get this. So it's probably just one, listening to the cues, but then figuring out what your body needs over time. And mm. so it might be this hit and miss sort of thing that you do. So you just said, that you did that workout, you went home, you could barely stand up, you took some water and some electrolytes, and then it helped you out. So now you've sort of learned a lesson. Yeah. And so now you know to maintain a, a, a different type of hydration at a different period. And I think it's just that game of figuring out when we need to hydrate and with what. There's no hard and fast rule. There's no take it at this time, don't take it at this time. It's about just learning from your body and your physiological cues. And it's the same when you go into the gym and lift weights. So mm. you may be doing the same movement as somebody, but you'll do it slightly different, catering to your own somatotype, catering to your own phenotype, your own body shape and body size, because you know your limits, you know what you can and you can't do. So a lot of it is that hit and miss. Hey, little mama, let me whisper in your ear, like, comment, subscribe to the channel because we continue to bring you peak content on this channel. Obviously, you guys are here. You guys have watched the whole video. So like, comment, subscribe. All right. See you later.